right. So we introduced F2 last week, and now we are looking at the first section of the syllabus, which constitutes 15% weight. And that's about 15% of your exam as well, which is equivalent to nine questions. So looking at this section, it's got about two chapters. Actually, it's got only two chapters, which means you can expect about four to five questions from each of the chapters. So as we will be navigating through chapter one, you ought to be asking yourself what is examinable so that you don't waste your time on what? On things that are not examinable. Sima has made the exam very easy by giving us the exam blueprint. So as we start each and every chapter, you will know exactly what you are expected to, to demonstrate your competence in. So for this chapter, the examiner expects you to have a good understanding of the characteristics of types of shares and long-term debt, which then brings us to the indication that the two sources of finance that we are going to be looking at are debt and equity, okay? So when we talk of shares, as you shall see, we have basically two types, the ordinary shares and the preference shares. Then for long-term debt, we do have bank loans and we also have various types of bonds. So by the end of the lecture tonight, you should be fairly comfortable with the characteristics of each of those you know, types of finance. The examiner also expects you to have a good understanding of the markets and the various methods of raising long-term finance, including the IPO, et cetera. And you also need to demonstrate competence in your understanding of the stock and bond markets, as well as the advisors that are involved with you know, the raising of finance. So here is just a mere chapter overview, which is showing us the types of long-term debt and the sources thereof, which are examinable at this um, level. So as we will be looking at these various um, you know, types of finance, the question that you need to be asking yourself is, what is the cost of this finance to the company? Because that is what then feeds into chapter two. So for every type of finance, you ought to know the cost thereof to the company. Okay, perfect. So as you shall see in P2, and for those that have already covered P2, you realize that there is a topic there on capital investments. Because for companies to thrive, they need to, to run projects. They need to invest in strategic projects. And whenever there is a need for an investment in a new project, there is definitely need for funding. So the principle is that as a finance personnel, it is your responsibility to make sure that the company sources the right amount of funds at the right cost and at the right time. So in principle, the cost of the finance, which is utilized by a company, it needs to be way less than the returns that are expected from that particular project, because that is the only way through which a company can create value. It will be pointless for a company to use finance, which is more expensive than the returns to be generated from the funded investment. So let's take a look at shares. According to SEMA, a share 
is a fixed identifiable unit of capital in an entity which normally has a fixed nominal value, which may be quite different from its market value. So it's imperative that we take note that this definition applies to both ordinary shares and preference shares. And when you see the word nominal value, it is exactly the same as face value and also par value. So the three can be used interchangeably. So please don't get um, confused. So as we look at these ordinary shares, please take note that the face value may be different from the market value because the market value is influenced by many market factors, et cetera. So when we do calculations in chapter two, you will need to take note of what value to use when you are calculating the cost of capital. I will not preempt that at this stage. So on shares, we basically have two types of shares. There is the ordinary shares and there is the preference shares. For us to get an understanding of the difference or the differences between the two, let's take a quick look at the characteristics of ordinary shares. So by definition, ordinary shares are issued to the owners of a company. And just because they are issued to the owners, it implies that the owners sit with all the risks and the rewards of their investment. And the fact that they sit with so much risk implies that the cost of equity is the most, you know, or is the highest to a company. So usually the power value of a share is a dollar unless you are told otherwise. So in an exam, if you are not given any values, you can just assume a nominal value of a dollar. So just because ordinary shares are issued to the owners of a company and they sit with all that risk, such shares also come with various rights to those uh, shareholders. What are those rights or entitlements? Right number one is for shareholders to attend the company general meetings. And when they do so, they can vote on important company matters, such as the appointment and re-election of directors. They can approve some takeover bids. They can appoint external auditors and they also approve the remuneration policy for senior executives. For those who have done corporate governance, you would have a clear picture of you know, these rights. Another right of ordinary shareholders is their entitlement to receive a share of any agreed dividend. Please take note of the word agreed. Who agrees on this dividend? It's the directors. So if the directors feel that there aren't sufficient distributable reserves, then they will just not you know, declare any dividends. But at the same time, they have to balance the act. Otherwise, if they fail to declare dividends, yet there is an expectation that might affect the, the share price. Okay. Another characteristic of ordinary shares, sorry, going back to this issue of the agreed dividend, it therefore follows that the dividend is not of a fixed nature. It all depends on the performance of the company. If a company performs well, the dividends are expected to, to increase. And they are also expected to grow over time because we expect growth in companies. Another characteristic of ordinary shares is the fact that ordinary shareholders being owners of the company, they have rights to their share of any assets that remain after liquidation. In other words, they have 
rights to the net assets of a company after deducting all its liabilities. And ordinary shareholders also, they are entitled to participate in any new issue of shares, even though it's not compulsory for them to do so. And where are these ordinary shares presented in the financial statement? You will find them in the balance sheet or the statement of financial position and they are presented as equity. What are the advantages and disadvantages of ordinary shares as a source of finance? So 